service with us. We're going to open in a word of prayer, and, uh, and we're going to spend a few more moments in song of praise and worship. The message this morning, we're going to be talking about in a message about communion, and we'll receive the elements of communion at the end of our service this morning, just so you're kind of aware of where we're going with that. And uh, so let's go ahead and open in, in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to be together to worship you, to learn from your word, to encourage one another, to build one another up in, in uh, Jude, Jude would say, our most holy faith. And Lord, we just uh, we invite you into this place to speak to us, to draw us closer to you. Lord, we pray for Pastor Larson this morning in Christ the King Lutheran Church. I just pray your blessing on their service today to so minister to their hearts and draw them closer to you. Pray for Pastor Larson as he leads the congregation and give him wisdom and direction and understanding. Our Lord, as the church and the ministers within our community, that you will help them be fruitful and effective in reaching the lost and meeting the needs and the hurting and the needy of our community. We pray for our churches in Panama today. We think of the Bambico Daily Campus. I just pray your blessing on that congregation as they minister within the city of David there, the northern part of this country. Uh, strengthen and encourage that body and uh, use them, Lord, as, as a source of light and hope for their city. And we pray for our missionaries. We think of the Zarns and their ministry uh, with the Secular People Initiative and teaching at North Central and continuing to to do ministry in Sweden as well. We just pray your hand on, on that uh, ministry. There's a variety of things that are there. And the distance between all of those, those points. Uh, we just pray your blessing and your faith. And we pray for the West Patals as well as they continue to work and minister in Ukraine and across the former Soviet Union, teaching in Bible schools and seminaries, and then bringing medical missions to a variety of places. Our Lord, keep them safe as they travel, as they minister, as they teach. All of those pieces that, that helps to equip the saints and, and to prepare others to come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, we just uh, commit our time together and our service to you today in Jesus' name.
share with you this morning some thoughts um, that I share with others, starting in John chapter 9, verse 1. You can follow along if you want, I know there's Bibles in some of them. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now Jesus passed by. He saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now here's the meat of the verses. I must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This message speaks personally to me. I can't help but picture in my mind's eye, the face of someone who is lost, needing Jesus. The words can be encouraging and depressing, really, depending upon the mindset of the reader. It's depressing because it's pointed out that the night is coming when no one can work. Encouraging because Jesus has clearly laid out a mission for all who have ears to hear and eyes to see. We must work the works of Him while it is still day. In the course of many years of meeting people in different circumstances, I have learned to pick out those who are 
lost and broken, even in a crowd. It's amazing. Your local Gideon camp has chosen a commitment to do just that by visiting the lost and broken in their lowest times, in the jails of our two counties, Washington, excuse me, half <laughs> Washington, but see them on Seward. We also need to, think there's a fun there somewhere. <laughs> Sorry. We also attend to dis and distribute scripture at all the high school baccalaureate services still being held that will allow us. And as of 2019, there were still four operating in these four, in these two counties. Another ministry is having booths where we're ready to share the work of Jesus at each of the county fairs. The conversations that happen in that setting with both the young and the old seeking reassurance, hope, love. They share this in a throng of people all around them because they want to know that they are supported. It will really shock you. We see everything from the absolute joy of knowing Jesus and his saving grace to the lost and pleading faces of those who are and have nowhere to turn. The culture has left them in the garbage heap of emptiness, not knowing what tomorrow will bring, but being so frightened of the next moment in their lives that fear is all they know. We don't have all the answers, that's for sure. But we know who does. Amen? Amen. And they are found in His Holy Word. It's our only mission, you see, to distribute Scripture and win souls for Christ along the way. An entire Bible like this one cost us $5. Uh, New Testament, like Pastor Brad was referring to in its various colors and sizes and shapes too, actually, costs us about a dollar and forty cents. Would you like to be a part of that mission? You could be. And we are here to tell you how. Pray. On the top of the list. Pray. Use the Gideon free cards that I know are here somewhere. <laughs> right, Brad? Yep. They're here. And I have a new whole new bunch to put in that card rack when I am able to find them. Donate today before you leave. Cindy and I will be standing at each of the doors. My wife is with me here. She's really good at that. <laughs> Uh, and I'm big enough you don't get by me too easy. No, just kidding. <laughs> Join us if you see a need. Feel the urge to help humanity. The cards work like this. It's not a terribly uh, difficult thing. They just have a message inside. They have a message outside, there's for all occasions, and they give you a chance to donate. The organization, if you choose to con consider it, is not just a man thing. You don't have to have white whiskers to do this. <laughs> okay? If you would like to know more about it, and spices, spouses are welcome for sure. There's a special work to be done by those who are willing to do it. We believe in men ministering to men, women ministering to men and women. The cost is high, though. Not so much in dollars, but in love and emotional investment to the lost. The blessings are beyond description and never-ending, as long as you are willing to make the investment. See us afterwards if you have questions. 
Thank you so much for allowing me to have this time. Thank you for the blessing of Pastor Brad and his ministry. Thank you for allowing us to participate in that ministry in the small way that we can. We pray a blessing on you and all your works. Thank you. A great ministry, Gideon. Gideon ministry is the Lord. I got a picture I'll show you later of a soldier. It's not the soldier, but it's his New Testament in Ukraine. And they're in an ongoing battle with the Russians. He had Gideon's New Testament in his pocket, and there's a bullet hole in it. But he lived to share the story. <laughs> the Word of God protected his heart in more ways than one. Praise God. We're going to let our kids. Ages three in the sixth grade, be dismissed to go to children's church and junior church at this time. We're going to have great, great lessons in those settings as they go this morning. A reminder that one thing that's in the bulletin, just kind of a reminder to get, kind of start getting it in your mind. There's a, a sign-up sheet on the table just inside the front door. Uh, so it's kind of the time of year where we're gearing up for our. Uh, I'm going to keep calling it the annual cookie. Trade giveaway. We've done this, uh, I think, 19 of the 22 years that we'll be here for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, we take cookies and treats and big trays of them to all the schools and the police department, the sheriff's department, the fire department, uh, the bank that we work with in town. They just, we, uh, about 200 or 300 dozens worth of cookies and treats get taken out. Uh, first week of December, I think it is. The information is in your bulletin, but if you can sign up to let Caroline coordinates that for us, and and uh, you can let her know that you're gonna you're gonna make ten dozen cookies or five dozen cookies or whatever it might be or bars. Um, that'll help her as she kind of keeps making plans for that, preparing for that that week of uh, ministry to uh, those who serve in our community in uh, various roles. And so we'd love your help with that participation in that this morning. So today we're going to be looking at uh, Into the Word. We're going to start in Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. We'll be there in just a moment. If you've got a Bible and you want to track along in your in your heart, the hard copy of your Bible, maybe it's on your phone or you've got a, a tablet or something with you, you can find it there as well. Luke chapter 22. We'll get there in just a minute. We're going to be talking about communion this morning. And as I said at the beginning, we'll be having communion at the end of our service. So over the last number of weeks, we, we've been looking at uh, hope, the idea, the concept, the, the thought, the, the reality of hope. We had a four-week series that we went through. It was called Hope is Here. And then the last couple of messages that we've had, we focused on, on hope in, a, in different perspectives, not necessarily directly connected with that series. And this morning, we're going to, as far as I'm concerned, we're talking about hope again. As we think about the hope that is given to us, as we remember, as we celebrate communion, as we go through the process of communion, it's a reminder again of the hope of salvation that we have. And praise God for that hope. And so uh, this morning, uh, we're going to be looking that direction. And you can see the title of our message is, You Are Invited. And uh, we'll talk more about that invitation here in just a couple of minutes. But if you want to turn, if you've got your Bibles open now to, to John, or excuse me, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, I'm going to start at verse um, 14. We're going to read down to verse 23, and then we'll skip down a few verses and pick up again at verse 31. And so we're going to read from there, Luke 22, 14. It says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. A son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which one of them it might be who would do this. 
Now moving down to verse 31. Jesus is speaking. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Simon replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Father, we just pray in these next few minutes as we as we work through this message, as we this this segment, and we, we come to the place of receiving communion, that you'll just, just speak to our hearts, draw us close to you. Help me, Lord, to be able to communicate your heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing I want us to look at this morning, just for a moment, is the price and the promise. As we read this passage, Jesus is about, is about to pay a terrible and awesome price for our salvation. Isn't that incredible thing to think about? He's, he, I mean, he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming, and he's chosen this setting. Friends, we, we always need to be mindful of that fact. But we also need to remember that he made a promise in that setting. He, he was not going away forever. He wasn't going to leave the disciples. He wasn't going to abandon them forever. That the separation was going to be temporary because, because he would come and bring them to be with him, that they would be able to share Passover observance together when it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And in this setting, as they're now in this upper room, and they're gathered together, the group of them, he offers them bread and the cup, and he promises that he would partake of the bread, which represents his body, and he said, drink again of the fruit of the vine when it, when it comes to the kingdom of God comes. He promised to confer <clears throat> on the disciples a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones. But first, but first, he would endure pain, betrayal, humiliation, and suffering, such as no one has before or since suffered. So I want us to look at some of what Jesus revealed about the promise about these promises that he made now to the disciples. Remember, we're in the upper room, and it's, it's at a later point he reveals some of the promise, what it's going to look like, what it's going to be like to the apostle John, as John is out in on the prison island of Patmos. And so you want to maybe turn over to Revelation chapter 19. And, and in this setting, Jesus is revealing some things to John, and John is writing them down, and I'm glad that he did because we have it today. When Jesus revealed to him. So we start in Revelation 19, starting in verse 6. John writes, he said, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like, the, like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. And then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then I saw the heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. And you can read more of that description if you keep reading through Revelation 19. You see, the truth is that all four of the Gospels, all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record Jesus' celebration of the, of the last Passover feast with his disciples. These accounts, you can find them and read through them in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, in Luke 22, where our text is for today, and then also in John 13. And although it's, it's likely, it's possible that Jesus 
had celebrated some other previous Passover meals with his disciples, there was something, there was something very special about this one. This was the one where it was going to be his last Passover supper on earth. And he made special arrangements, arrangements for this Passover. You might remember that he told two of his disciples, we're going to celebrate Passover. I want you to go into town, and you're going to find this guy. He told them who this guy was. You're going to find him. You'll, you'll see him. And then tell him, we're going to come and have Passover at your house. Where's the room? And, we're going to, and he, he had made all prearranged all of this. He's put some thought and effort into this process of for this Passover meal. We would Today we call it a Seder meal. And we've gone through several of those here at our church. And just seeing that process and all the pieces that connect with that. And this is going to be the last time that he would do this with his disciples. And he extended a special invitation to all of his disciples, for all of them to be with him in this setting, which here in Luke's account we read that we read earlier, Jesus says to them as they sit in this setting now, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you the truth, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Close to the Close to the end of this very special Passover meal, Jesus presented the symbol that he had chosen to remind his followers of his sacrificial death, the bread and the cup. And at one time, he, he took the emblems in his hands as he led the disciples through what we think of and would understand as the very first Christian communion. He's transitioning from that Seder meal for his followers to now communion that we still celebrate today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, there we read Paul reminding us that, that every time we come to the Lord's table, and we're here, we're at the Lord's table, we're receiving communion because Jesus has invited us. He's invited us. He said, every time you do this, every time you do this, I want you to remember this. And he's invited us there. Paul reminds us that this should be a very special time for us, just as it was for the disciples in that first setting as they were there with Jesus that night. As disciples just celebrated this, that first Christian communion, their attention was focused in three, three directions that night. They looked back. As Jesus told them to, they looked around and really inside themselves. It wasn't just looking at each other. It wasn't just looking around the room. They, they certainly did that. There were some questions to be answered. But they also looked inside of themselves. We'll touch on that. And then, and then they looked ahead. And so we're going to quickly grab a hold of those three areas where the disciples looked. They looked back at their heritage of faith. And we need to look back at our heritage of faith as well. At Passover... The Jewish disciples look back. They look back to the night in their history when Moses led their forefathers in the slaying of the spotless, unblemished lamb. And then, and then as the people of Israel would place that blood on their doorposts of every home in the land of Goshen where they were living, all in an effort to protect Israel's firstborn children from the death angel. You see, that was the very night that the death angel broke the will of a stubborn pharaoh by killing the firstborn of every Egyptian family and their animals, the firstborn of all the animals. It was a night of history when the children of Israel were finally set free from the bondage of Egyptian slavery, and they began their exodus from Egypt toward the promised land, led, of course, by a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire by night. It's in this setting that Jesus helps his disciples to look back even further, back to the moment in time in eternity past, before time as we understand it began, when he himself, when Jesus chose to answer the Father's call on his life. See, this wasn't a last-second plan. This was a plan that before time as we know it began, the Father said to the Son, there's going to come a time when you will go and you will be the Passover lamb. You will be the sacrificial lamb. And Jesus takes them back to that moment when in eternity past he says yes to that plan. 
He reminded them that before, before time began that he made this choice to be there with them on that particular night. I have longed, I've looked forward to this night. I've wanted to be with you on this night. He chose to take upon himself the form of a servant. He chose to become obedient to the Father, even though it would mean his death on the cross. He chose to become the Lamb of God, slain from the creation of the world. Revelation 13, 8, to 8 tells us, slain from the creation of the world, slain from before time. See, this was so assured in God's heart, in the Father's heart, before time began, this was the plan, and it was so sure that it happened before time as we know it began. And Jesus wanted the disciples to understand, when you look back, understand that before, before any of this was here, I said yes to this. I was so sure in my yes that it was as though it had happened already. Slain from the creation of the world. The disciples looked back. Jesus looked back. And I would suggest, friends, this morning that, that as we approach this very special moment with the Lord, that you and I, we need to look back to that time when we were still slaves to sin. All of us have a point in our life when we can look back and we can know. We can remember that moment. When we repented of our sin, when Jesus came and washed us and cleansed us, we need to look back this morning to remind ourselves who we were, who we were, before Jesus came and cleansed us, before we, that first communion with Jesus, where we were changed by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, spiritually washed in the blood of Christ. The truth is, friends, our children and our grandchildren need to hear us publicly say who we were before Jesus came into our lives. They need to hear about the difference that Jesus made in the way that we live, in the way that we relate to our husband or our wife in marriage, and, and every change that Jesus has affected in our lives. We need to be sharing that with the generations behind us. They need to hear those stories, that there is power in Christ, power to affect significant change. The Israelites' descendants still celebrate Passover today because they don't ever want to forget who they were and where they were before God miraculously delivered them from slavery. And we should do nothing less. Look back at your spiritual experience, friends. We need to remember how powerful that moment was when we finally allowed Jesus to come into our hearts and to forgive our sins. And how simple it was when we finally allowed our spirits to bypass our intelligence and to pray with the Spirit of God in a language that could not be taught or shaken into us by some overzealous Christian. We need to look back to the times when Jesus healed us, when he extended our lives for his glory. We need to remember the times that he broke through in impossible moments in our personal lives, in our families, in our congregational experiences. We need to remember those things and talk through those things because it's God honoring as we remember those moments that everything changed when Jesus stepped in. All of us have those moments when we could say, this was what it was, but Jesus stepped in, but God stepped in, and then everything changed. And then we see the disciples looking around and within themselves, and we too need to look around and look within ourselves. The disciples, they took a look around them. They seated among them as Jesus told them, the, the hand of the person who's going to betray me is on the table with me. And is seated among the twelve at that table was the one who would betray Jesus and, and one who would even deny knowing him before the day was done. When Jesus said that one of them would betray him, the disciples began to inquire among themselves as to who might possibly be the one. They're looking at each other. Is it you? Is it me? They're asking, is it me? Is it you? They're, they're wondering. They're looking around. They're wondering through those things in their mind. Both Jesus and Judas knew the identity of the betrayer. The other, others wondered aloud. One of them even made the most honest statement when he said, Am I he? Is it me? Judas, Judas wouldn't be honest. And Peter didn't seem to have the ability to be honest. 
Neither Judas nor Peter was able to be honest about the condition of their own hearts at this, at this first communion celebration. Judas wouldn't be honest because, because the truth is he had already struck a bargain. He had already had the 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. And Peter, Peter couldn't be honest because he was still so spiritually blind that he couldn't see what the Lord already knew to be true about who he was. Everyone, everyone who has ever known and then betrayed the Lord, everyone who has ever known and then denied the Lord, truth is they've all had the opportunity to take part in communion observance, such as we're about to come to here in just a few minutes, invited there just like us by the Lord. These men and women have simply sat there and neglected the opportunity of self-examination that could have spared them tragedy and pain. Self-examination, friends, is one of the main purposes of communion. Please, this morning, let me just say it even at this point. Don't allow yourself to miss an opportunity with the Lord this morning in that moment of self-examination. God, is there something still hidden in me? that I haven't dealt with. Is there still something there that is, is keeping me from a closeness? And that's the moment. He says, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Look at those things. Let the Spirit help you. Then we see the disciples. We see Jesus looking forward to the future, and we as well need to look forward to the future. It's highly probable that some among us this morning will deny the Lord. It's a frightening and a solemn thought. But if, but if you understand much about the human heart, the nature of the human heart, then you know that I'm telling you the truth. It's very likely in this room some will fail the Lord. It's quite possible that a group of this size, some here are too prideful to confess or to forsake the secret thoughts and behaviors that are dragging them down and that will eventually destroy their Christian witness. We don't have to point any fingers because we know inside that that's me. We all know what it is to hear the sad news of a fellow believer who has experienced a moral behavior, a failure. We can't help but wonder what could have possibly been going through his or her mind in those moments when they approached the table of the Lord, the place where they could have confessed and, and, and taken care of their shortcomings, their sin, before the crowing of their rooster. What was so important to them that, that the invitation of the Lord to examine themselves was set aside for some other agenda? Was that night in that upper room with Jesus and the Twelve, that first communion service, that the disciples took a look back as well? They looked back around and they looked ahead and, and although this could have been the very first time that Jesus shared bread and cup with the disciples at a Passover celebration, but it's not, we're not told that in Scripture whether they did or didn't have that together. This would definitely not be the last time. Verse 16 of our text this morning, we hear Jesus' words as he says to the disciples, <clears throat> he says to them, I tell you, I will not eat this again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God, which obviously means there's going to come a day when Jesus and the disciples and all of us who are followers of Christ will share this meal together at grand table in heaven. What did they look forward to that moment? This is what this look forward is. Jesus said, listen, guys, I, I want you to, I'm going to give you something to look at. There's going to be some tough moments ahead here. There's going to be some tough things in your life that are going to come forward. But, but even when you're in the process, because he asked the disciples, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And James and John, yeah, we can do that. He said, you don't have a clue, guys. You will drink my cup. You will drink the cup of suffering. But remember this. One day, one day, in my Father's house, we're going to share this meal together. Amen. One day. So no matter what's going on in our life, no matter how difficult things may be, we've got this to look forward to. One day, Jesus is going to hand me the bread and the cup. One day. Hallelujah. Praise God. He promised his followers, because they were faithful to stand with him in this hour of trial, that when he inherited the kingdom from his father, the father of the kingdom that his father's prepared for him, that he would likewise assign a part of that kingdom to them. 
They would eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. They would be seated on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Truth is, every, every celebration of a communion should anticipate that moment when we finally hear a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, like the peal of thunder, a, a sound of a harpist playing their harp. When we will hear the voices saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding supper of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. What a day that will be, friends. So just for a moment, preparing for the marriage supper of the Lamb, each of us, each of us must do whatever is necessary to get ready for that wedding banquet. We have to do whatever it takes for us to be prepared for that wedding banquet. By the time that we're seated at that banquet, we will already have been to the judgment seat of Christ. We will see how wrong we were to think that he never noticed the things that we did in his name. We'll discover that every cup of cold water that we've given to someone with the right motive will be committed to our credit. That those times where we felt little or no affirmation from fellow believers or little recognition from our church or fellowship, that, that they will prove to be times when Jesus was standing beside us cheering us on. We'll realize that he saw what we did in his name. If we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. Some will walk away from the judgment seat of Christ having their works tried by fire with only their eternal souls and nothing left to lay at his feet. They'll discover that life on earth was merely a heap of ashes. Others are going to find that their works truly built something of kingdom value, they, that they became elements of gold and silver and precious stones. For these believers in all, all of the trials and tribulations during their earthly years will be worth whatever they had to, to endure. Once they see Jesus and hear his voice saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Great marriage supper of the Lamb to which you and I have been invited. It is a great event that the angel told John to write, blessed are those. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of God, the angel said. So this morning, as we, as we approach the table of the Lord, let's remind ourselves where and who we were before Jesus. Before he came into our life as our Savior and Lord. Let's make sure we look around the room. We need to realize that some here today, maybe even me, will undoubtedly fall from the Lord and deny him. Unless each of us accepts his invitation to examine ourselves privately in his presence. However, friends, none who are here at the table with us today need to leave afraid of failure if our hearts will be open to him and the voice of his spirit and his word speaking to us cleansing us with his blood and strengthening us by his spirit. Uh, my prayer is that each of us will determine that we are not going to be the one who will betray the Lord, that we will guard our hearts. Talked about that in Sunday school this morning. May we purposefully and regularly examine ourselves in his presence. And we're going to close the message in a word of prayer, and we're going to transition and receive the elements in just a moment. You bow your heads with me. Father, thank you. The invitation Jesus gave to the twelve on that very special night, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to be with you tonight, to share this meal with you tonight, that he, that he invites us to the same way. Eagerly, Jesus eagerly desires to share with us one day in your kingdom, at your table, but we have to be prepared. We have to be ready. And Lord, I pray in these moments, if there's any that are, are not ready today, they haven't turned from their sin, they haven't, they haven't repented, they haven't trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, that this will be the day, this will be the moment that they take care of that piece of business. I pray that 
as others are searching their heart, giving you opportunity right now to help them search their heart. If there are things that they need to confess of, that they need to make right between you and them, that this is the moment <coughs> that begins to happen in their hearts. Oh, Jesus. Friends, as you continue to pray just for a moment, I want to give us that opportunity. If you have not repented of your sin, if you haven't trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you'd like to do that this morning, would you just lift up your hand for a moment? Just hold it up for just a moment. I want to lead you in a prayer of repentance. I want to help you to be ready to receive the elements of communion this morning in a way perhaps you've never experienced it before. Is that you today? Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to ask John and Pastor Hank and Dan if they'll come. They're going to, we're going to receive the elements of communion. They'll come to you this morning and just distribute those while you're seated at the, in your place. And Kim and John will want to kind of carry it back. We're going to lead in some, so we're going to have another song. You may want to just stand and sing with them. Maybe you're more comfortable seated. Seated, seated and singing, you can do that as well. Said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you do it in remembrance of me. Paul reminds us that whenever we eat the bread, whenever we drink the cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We're looking forward to that day. We're looking forward to that day when we will share it together with him. Father, we just pray that as we hold now in our hands these elements, these reminders of the brokenness of the body of Christ, of the blood that was shed, reminding us again of our past, where we were before, before Jesus Christ death on the cross, before he came into our life as Lord and Savior, helping us to look inside and see where we are today, and, and if there are those things that need to be dealt with today, God, every time we hold these things, these elements in our hands, it reminds us to look back, to look around us and inside of us, to look forward to that day. God, we thank you. We thank you for these reminders that we hold today. We ask your blessing on them as we receive them together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and just receive both the bread and the cup. We're going to sing one last song as we're playing. We'll sing that together. That'll be our concluding song and our benediction as well.